now we're going to transition to a different type of models which are also part of the linear program operation research area and these are the slides for or the lecture on network model so I'm pretty sure you have heard about this word network now it's very popular for social networking and so on but today we're going to talk about the different type of network and these are networks that are very applied in industry, specifically in those areas in logistics. So this topic is part of your chapter 6 book. Your book, you can find this topic in chapter 6. And one more time, I'm showing you the, the objectives for, for this course. And we are basically on the last one, still there. We have gone through all of them already. And we're going to talk about a new type of industrial problem, and those are column networks. Okay, remember that next week we're going to have our third partial. That's on Thursday. Um, the material that will be covered is basically transportation and assignment models, the integer programming topics, and the material will be covered this week, so on network models. Just be aware, remember if you, if you do well, you got those points from the exercise we discussed today, you might not be, I mean, you probably don't need to take the final. So just make an extra effort, try to do well on that third exam, and you might um, skip that final course and take the time to study for your other exam. So just Keep that in mind. Um, if you want to take the final, that's also fine. So, um, but I encourage you to do well on that third partial. Um, so the learning objectives to discuss the special types of linear integer programming problems. These are called networks. And we're going to focus our discussion in, in this problem, the shortest part, shortest path problems, um, which is very popular. Um, and we're going to learn specialized algorithms for each type of problem. So for the shortest path problem, we're going to discuss the Dijkstra algorithm, which is a, it's an algorithm that makes um, the solution time for solving this problem very, very short. So it's very elementary. You can follow the steps very easily. And you'll see how easy it is to implement and also how good is the algorithm for solving these problems. Uh, so the recommended readings, you have three topics here that you can look in your, in your textbook if you're interested. So the agenda, you're going to discuss the notation and terminology, the shortest path problem, and the algorithm for solving this type of problem. So let's talk a little bit about network models. These are optimization models that exhibit a very special structure. Uh, for special cases, this structure uh, dramatically reduces the computational complexity. So, um, in class, I have mentioned several times that when you start seeing large problems or, or large models, when you try to solve those in a, in a computer, then sometimes it, it will take a lot of time. Like, um, if you have a problem with 10,000 variables and you try to solve that in a computer, that can take one day, two days, and so on. So depending on your uh, how good your computer is and uh, the type of software that you're using. But there are times specifically in industry that you don't have the time to wait. So you need to get a solution right away. So for those type of problems, there are, there are people who are focusing on finding ways to solve those problems very fast. And for this type of problem, if you, are, if you are able to formulate your problem as a network, as a shortest path problem, you can use the algorithm that we're going to discuss in this lecture, and you can solve the problem very fast without having to use a solver, for instance. So the first widespread application of LP problems to industrial logistics. So this is something that I already mentioned. So these problems are very applied to logistics, and this is also uh, very related to what we have covered so far 
specifically with the transportation problem. So, uh, network models also address a huge number of diverse applications. So, some notation, what we have here is what we call a network. This is also called a directed graph, a digraph, or a graph. So, what we have here is four nodes and some marks that are connecting those nodes. So if you want to define a network, the notation that is usually um, used is the following. So the network name will always have two uh, sets. So you will call the network G, and you will have a, net, uh, a set of nodes and a set of arcs. So those are the two components for your network, the arcs and the nodes. So if you want to name those nodes, you can use N. And you know you have four nodes, so your nodes are one, two, three, and four. And your arc set is a list of the start node and the end node for each arc. So if you look here from node one, we have two arcs, one that goes from one to three, and one that goes from one to two. So those two arcs are the first two listed in this set. If you move to note number two, you have an arc from two to four. That is the last one listed here. If you go to three, then you're going to have three to two. And if you go to still in three, you also have three to four. You can notice that there's no arc coming from four. All of the arcs connected to four are coming from other nodes. So, there will be no arc in your arc set with the four <coughs> as a starting node. Okay, so, if you want to define, you want to name your network, you know that you're going to have to define these two sets, one for the nodes and one for the arcs. The, there's a difference between uh, networks. This is what we call an undirected graph. This is what we call a directed graph. And the difference is just uh, that one of them have the arcs with uh, directions. So you know that from one to two, you're going to have to go from here to here. Versus an undirected graph in which you can go from one to two to two to one. Independently of the direction. So one of them tells you the direction of the arc. The other one is basically telling you that you can go from one to the other and from this one to, to the other without any constraint. Networks are used to transport commodities like physical goods, communication, electricity, and so on. And the field of network optimizations concern an optimization problems on networks. Okay, so as you know, or if you think about it, that we have networks everywhere. You can see physical networks, uh, road networks, railway networks, airline traffic networks, electrical networks. So there's a lot of applications for these type of problems. Um, there's also abstract networks such as organizational charts, present relationships in process, and so on. And I'm pretty sure you can think about other type of applications for for these type of problems. So I talk about social networks. Um, so networks are everywhere. And what we have here is the representation of the subway map in Manhattan, New York. So you can see there's several routes and optimizing the transportation time from one side to the other is a very difficult problem and a very difficult task. So these type of models are, are used for some type of problem. So in our view, networks and graphs are powerful modeling tools. More OR models have networks or graphs as a major aspect. So in the next few lectures, we will develop models that are efficiently solvable. And this will help you to form a toolkit for those problems that are harder to solve. So this is also something that I mentioned early in this course. So once you start looking at these problems, get familiar with them, you can start creating some recipes 
So if you see a problem, you see, oh, this problem can be modeled in this way. Or this is a problem that can be modeled using the transportation model. Or this is a problem that can be modeled using the network model. Or this is an interior programming model. Or this is a NAFTA problem. So if you get familiar with these models, then it will become very easy for you to see the application and see the type of model that you can use to model such type of application. So next what we're going to do is to discuss the representation of networks. And this will give you an insight in terms of computing power and also an implement, in the implementation uh, perspective if you were to implement uh, these problems in a computer. Okay, so we can represent the graph from the, in different ways based on the, on the network. So this is what we call the agents agency matrix for directed graph. So what we do is we have a row for each node. So this is uh, the rows. So we have four nodes, four rows. And we have a column for each node. And we put the one in row I, column J, if there's an arc between those two nodes. So in this case, we have an arc from 1 to 2 and 1 to 4. So you will see there's a 1 here from 1 to 2, and there's an arc from 1 to 4. Okay, so this is what we call the agency matrix for a directed graph. Same thing will apply from 4 to 3, so there's an arc from 4 to 3, so you see there's a 1 here from 4 to 3. There's an arc also from 4 to 2, you put a 1 from 4 to 2. Now a question for you, what would happen if we, instead of having 4 to 2, that arc became 2 to 4? <coughs> so instead of having... This arc, we have now this arc. So there's one of the numbers that is going to change here in the in the matrix. So right now we have a one here, telling us that you go from four to two. But now the arc is going on the opposite direction. So that one will be a zero and you will have a one here. Does that make sense? So remember in this type of work, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. So I now understand why you were looking me at like, what's that? <laughs> so it's two to four, correct. So you go now from two to four instead of four to two. Okay. We have another type of representation this uh, for under undirected graph. So we follow a process. We have rows for each node, column for each node, and we put a, a one in row I column if there's an arc. So we can have more ones now than previously because we are basically repeating from each direction. So one to two. 1 to 2, and you also have 2 to 1. And 1 to 4, you have 4 to 1. Um, 2 to 3, you have 3 to 2. So you have to leave. It's basically saying that instead of having one direction, you have both. So you go from this way, and you also go this way. So you're going to have a 1 for each direction. Okay. Now, 
based on that, we can define the degree of a node in the number of incident arcs. And we're going to use this later on in this lecture. So the degree, again, is the, it's the number of incident arcs. So the incident arcs are the, the arcs that are connected to that particular node. So we can define the degree for each one of those nodes. So for one, we have two. So it's four and two. For two, we have three, three arcs. For three, we have two arcs. And for four, we have three arcs. Okay, so that's the degree for each node. We also have another type of representation. There's multiple, again, um, I just described some of them. So this is called the node arc incident matrix. So we have a row for each node. We have a column for each arc. So now notice that instead of listing the nodes at the top, we are listing the arcs. So we have a letter for each arc, A, B, C, D, and E. And we're going to use that information to represent our network. So we put a, a 1 in row I column, J, if R, J starts at node I. And a minus 1 is the opposite. So from here you can see that arc A starts in 1 and ends in 4. So, since it starts in 1, you put the 1 here. And since it ends in 4, you put the minus 1 in 4. <laughs> Same, if you look at this arc, arc E, you got to go here to this column. And you put a 1 on that node where the arc starts. So this is 1, and you're going to put a minus 1 on that node where the arc ends. So that's minus 1. Any questions? Okay. So again, same questions, what will happen if arc 42 became arc 24? So if we have this, so we're going to look at Z. use the same color. So Z. So instead of having minus 1 in 2, this will be 1 and this will be minus 1. Because we are changing the direction of the arc. So now it will start in 2, and it will end in 4. And one more representation. This is represent, representation of art list for directed graph. So create an art list for each node. So we have for one, we have two arcs. So you go from one to four and one to two. So those are the arcs. We have for node number two, we have the arc that goes from two to three. For node number three, there's no arcs going from three to other node. So this is empty. And for node number four, we have two arcs. One goes from 4 to 2, and 1 goes from 4 to 3. So again, there's a lot of very different, uh, very similar variants of this type of representation. And the idea is to find the best way to represent a graph using numbers. 
So you can implement the algorithms that I talked talk about earlier in a computer so you can solve these problems very fast. Okay? So if you can represent the graph very simple, then you can use that information to implement your algorithms and find the solution. Okay, so each representation has its advantages. Major purpose of a representation is again efficiency in our algorithms and the ease of use. The no R incidence matrix shows up in linear programs. And next, what we're going to do is just define some networks. So we have different types of networks, and I'm going to name some of them for the purpose of this lecture. Can I go to the next slide? Okay. So these are four different types of networks. First one is what we call a path. So let me show you the figure here. The characteristics of this path is that there no node is repeated and directions are ignored. So you can go from one node to the other without looking at any directions. So that means that you can go 5, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 2, 3, and 4, and you can also go on the other way. Now, a directed path, that one does have <laughs> a direction. So you know that the only way you define this path, 1, 2, 5, 3, and 4, the only way that you can go from 1 to 4 is you follow that path. Okay, so no, no node is repeated and directions are important. We also have a network type called cycle. So a path with two or more nodes, except that the first node is the last one, and directions are ignored in a cycle. So for instance, we can define a cycle. Again, you start in one node and you end on the same node, and there's no directions. So this is also called a loop. Okay? So if you want to travel from your your house to the university and coming back, that can also be a cycle. You go basically in that loop. Now, we also have the directed cycle. Again, no node is repeated and directions are important. So you go from the first node, you go around and end on the same node that you started. That's a directed cycle. So the major difference between these two, the first one and the second one, are the directions. Major difference between the third one and the fourth one are also the directions. So one have, one of them has directions, the other one does not consider the, the directions. Yes. So in this one, you don't have a closed loop. Oh, so, so going back to one. You don't close, yes, basically you, don't, you never close that loop. You go from one point to the other, but you cannot return from, from here to here in the director cycle. Any other questions? OK. We can also define a walk. So here we have the same network. Walks are paths that can be that can repeat nodes in arcs. So if you repeat an arc in your directed cycle, that becomes a walk. So for example, a directed walk, one, two, three, four, four, one, two, three, five, four, two, three, five, you're repeating node five and node two. So we can look at that walk here. So we go from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 5, 4 to 5, 5 to 4, 4 to 2 again, 2 to 3 again, 3 to 5 again, and that's your path. Okay, so you have a cycle <coughs> inside of that network representation. 
but you also have the pack. So it is not a closed loop because you have these extra arcs and it's also repeating some of the arcs in that walk. A walk is closed if we the first and last node are the same. In this case, that's not the case. A closed walk is a cycle except that it can be repeated notes and arms. So you can have rep uh, repeated notes and arms. That's the difference between the cycle and a walk. Okay, more terminology. A undirected network is connected if every node can be reached from every other node by a path. So every, every, even though this is not connected, this node 2 and 5, you know that you can reach node 5 from node 2 by going through these arcs. So that makes the graph connected, or the network connected for all the nodes. A unconnected network will be something like this. So you have 6 and 7, which are connected, but you cannot reach them from any of these nodes. Okay? A directed network is connected if this undirected version is connected. Okay? So if you look at the undirected version and you can see that those nodes are connected, then the directed network is also connected. This directed graph is connected even though there's no direct path to the path. So that's what I mentioned earlier. Okay, so let's, let's now consider this, this problem. This is a very, very old problem that I brought here because for me it's very interesting. So, this is giving you a little bit of history. Uh, graph theory is the theory that study networks, and this started in, in 1736, and Leonard Euler visited this town, it's in Germany, called Königsberg, and there were some people wondering whether it's possible to take a walk and end up where you started from cross each bridge in this connector exactly once. And this was generally believed to be impossible. So what you have is this uh, area that is kind of an island. And you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bridges. And you're trying to find if you can go from each point to, to another without crossing that bridge twice without crushing one of the bridge, bridges plot. So this is the problem. If your stop starts here, I want to find out if you are able to go to each part of these areas without crossing each, net, each bridge twice. So my question is, is it possible to start in A here? cross over each bridge exactly one and end up back in A. Are you able to find that path that can perform or is it possible? So if you try to start here and if you think about this problem this is the type of problem that you you'll see a um, let's say a the post office will face if you're trying to find the best way to take your mailman and deliver everything. So you start here, maybe you can cross this bridge, you are here, and then you want to go here, then come back here, here. But you basically cannot, you didn't cross this bridge. So, any ideas?
You go A, 3, 7, then you need to cross one of these two. You can't, you can't. go 3 down to 7, that's a 4. If you cross here, then you, you need to cross one of these two. Yeah, so that's... So you can go here, 3, 7, then 6, 4, you are back to this area and you already crossed these two. So there's no way that you can go this direction. So if you go this way, maybe go back here, then you are ending on the same position. So you already crossed these two. So if you go here, 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 you are not crossing to come to this point, you are not able to get to set. So, think about it. <coughs> we can move to the next slide. So, we can conceptualize this as a network model in which land maintenance are nodes. And Bridges are parts, so we have those seven, and this is our network. So now we can try to solve this problem based on, on a network. So translation to graph or networks is there's a walk starting at A and ending at A and passing through each part exactly one. So that's the question we're going to answer. We want to cross each arc, each arc once, and we want to go back to A. And the answer for this problem is there's no such a wall. Okay, that doesn't exist. So the number of arcs incident to B is twice the number of times that B appears on the wall. So B has twice the number of arcs that times B appears on the wall. So, in order to get such a wall, we need to add these two arcs. So we have arc 8 and 9, and here's a wall. You go A1, AB, BB, DB, BC, BA, AC, CD, and D. Now, this is what we call a Eulerian cycle, which is a close close walk that passes through each arc exactly once. So in order to find this Eulerian cycle, we need to define the degree of a node, which is again the number of arcs incident to the node. So remember in our description of a network using uh, numbers, we discussed how to obtain the degree of a node, but we were counting the number of arcs that were incident to each node. So the necessary condition in order to get that cycle is that each node has an even degree. So each node needs to have an even degree in order to be able to get that wall. Why is this necessary? The degree of a node j is twice the number of times j appears on the wall, except for the initial and final node of a wall. If every node has an even degree, and if the graph is connected, then there is a Eulerian cycle. So that's the only way that you can get such type of wall.
Okay? So that answers your question. So in order to find such a walk, we need to make sure that each node has an even number of arcs. Here we have six. This one has four. This one has four. And this one has four. Okay. So linear cycles and extensions are used in practice. For example, male career routes visit each city block at least once. <coughs> Minimize travel time. And but you know that there's other constraints in practice, for example, traffic and so on. Um, also, trash pickup routes each visit each city block at least one to minimize travel time. And there's also other constraints that need to be considered, but this is these are two applications that directed use this uh in cycle. Okay, more definitions. A network is connected if every node can be reached from every node from by following a sequence of arc in which directions is ignored. Now, expanding three is a connected subset of a network including all nodes but containing node cycles. So expanding three basically connects all the nodes but without having any cycles, without having any arc or Closed loops. Okay, so from this network, we can define several spanning trees, such as this one. So all the nodes are connected. These are connected, <coughs> and these all all of them are connected without having a cycle. And out three is a spanning tree which in which every node has exactly one coming arc, except for the root. So I'm pretty sure you have seen this type of representation before. That's what we call a out three. And here in, in out three, there's a directed path from the root to all other nodes, meaning that all paths come out the root. So say you have a network or you have a supply chain and you want to distribute all your goods to different stores, you can think about that in such representation. So you're moving your goods to these distribution centers, and from those distribution centers, you're going to move them to warehouses, and from those warehouses, you can move them to stores. So that's an application in which you can use a outreach. Okay, so finally, we're going to look at this type of problem. So today what we're going to do is just an introduction to the problem. Next time, we're going to talk about the solution method. So the shortest path problem. So what is the shortest path from a source node to a sync node? That's the question we want to answer. So let's say we have a distribution center here, and we want to get to our customers. We want to find the best way or the shortest way to go from one point to the other. Okay, so that's the type of question we want to answer with this type of network. Okay, so again, what is the shortest path from one source node to a sync node? So we're going to go from our source to our sync. We're going to use our network, and we want to find what is the shortest path. Okay, so by looking at this figure, can you tell me what is the shortest path from no one to no six? Should be easy to to find. So I think you can basically. Define a set of steps that will guide you to get the shortest path. So if you start here, you want to go from one to six. So if you start here, you know, oh, okay, so two may be the best option because it's the shortest direction. So you can start going to two. So 
So let's start here. So at that point you have two. And then at that point you want to go this way will give you four. This way we'll add two. So you can go this way. And then go this way. So this point is four. This point is six. Would that be the first path? I think so. So that process, that same steps that you were defining in order to get that shortest path, that's what the process that followed the algorithm that we're going to discuss. And it's very simple. As you see, you can, by looking at the network, you can easily define what's the best solution. Forward path, backward path. Backward? Oh, yeah. It's, it's similar. Correct. So you're going to do a search, a step backward. I would say we're going to go the other direction, not backward, the other direction. Forward, yeah. So we're going to be start, uh, looking at the options that we have until that point, and based on those options, we're going to decide what to do next. Okay? So that's the idea. And again, I'm, I know you're familiar with this, but that, that, uh, what I want you to see is the intuition behind. So you can come up with a large network. And try to solve it on a computer will take days, but if you can define this type of algorithm, it will solve the, solve the, the problem very fast. So, assumptions for this lecture, there's a path from the source to all the other nodes, and R, all the arts left are non-negative. Having those assumptions makes things more easy, but if we add those, no, we uh, quit or take out those assumptions, then um, problems become more, more difficult to solve. But for now, we're going to keep it simple. So, where does it arise in practice? Common applications are shortest path in the vehicle, shortest path in internet routing, and shortest paths around Texas State University. If you want to go, um, I don't know, to one of the buildings, you always try to find out the best or shortest way to get there unless you're trying to exercise. So, how will we solve the shortest path problem? You're going to use the diagram. algorithm. So, in our next lecture, we're going to discuss the diagram algorithm. And I think that's all I'm going to... Well, I think we did this already. Maybe we can start with this next time. So, that's all we're going to have for today. We need some uh, extra time, but let me know if you still have questions um, about what we discussed at the beginning of the lecture, and keep remember that we're going to have our exam next next week. Okay? Can we have a Sure. I can prepare the we need. You know, you guys have that many. I thought nobody gave exams by the end of the semester. So everybody is basically not giving finals and finishing early. That's. Um, I have two questions. Or this one's optional, and then one that is final. Interesting. Yeah, I assume that by the end of the semester, the other courses will wait until the final period. That's not the case. Okay, so. <laughs> well, and the thing is that the last day for us to, I mean, for me to be able to give you the exam is next Thursday. After that, the calendar doesn't allow us to the final. So the other option that we can discuss is maybe not having the partial and everybody takes the final. But the final will be 
So I think, yeah, it would be better just to take the part of it and figure out if you need to take the, the final. <coughs> I think at the end, we'll, yeah, we'll benefit the majority of you. Just let me know. Um, so today I'm going to post a new homework. And that homework, that homework will, will be submitted the day of the, of the exam. We're going to discuss it on Tuesday. That's going to be part of your review. Okay, so the homework probably contains some problems from, from this lecture. You're, you're not going to be able to solve them until Thursday, but just to make your work. So that homework is going to be posted today. We'll then discuss it on Tuesday and it's due the day of the exam. Okay? Okay, so I'll see you on Thursday.